What's up, everybody? Today is Monday. Happy Monday, October 9, 2017. This is the MMA Junkie Radio pre-show. I am Goes. To my left is Dan Tom. Working hard. Gorgeous George back in an undisclosed location. Danny Otto in a disclosed location in New York. He's our producer, of Hi. course. And to my right, if you guys are wondering who that is, that's Marcus from Atlanta. He's called the show many a times for years, even going all the way back to when we were Tag Radio. And he's here to visit today. So I thought we'd, uh, minutes. we'd let him do the pre-show with us. And then when it's time to start the show, you got to bounce. But he'll be listening off on the side. Uh, but what brings you to Las Vegas, Marcus? Uh, man, I came for a UFC 216 to watch uh, Liam Ferguson. Yeah. And uh, most definitely I had a good time watching the fights. And, uh, and every time I come in town, I always got to stop by the MMA Junkie Radio Studios. Oh, yeah. To pay homage to one of my favorite uh, radio shows I've been watching, listening to for, I don't know, maybe like eight it's a two-way street, though, Eight years. and eventually one of my little tag radio slash MMA junkie radio bucket list items is to go to your bookstore. Oh, make it happen whenever you're in town. Yeah. I got you. I'd love to do that. Nubian, cool. right? Yeah, Nubian Bookstore in Atlanta, Georgia. I've uh, been open since February 5th of 99. Uh, dropped out of college and uh, decided to open up my own business, and I've been uh, successful. Six years was enough? How? Is that why you dropped out? What would you say, George? Coming up I in a minute. Six Six years was enough. Is that why you jumped out? <laughs> 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 nah, it's just um, <laughs> the first uh, 14 years I was inside the shopping mall, so you may have uh, more restrictions as far as you know when you can open and close. But now that I moved outside the mall yeah. to a, a standing, um, uh, own standing store, I can open and close and leave when I want to and come when I go. So now I have way more freedom. So. But you miss that food court though in the mall. Nah, I, I, I like I like the new situation way yeah. better, way better. But that food court. Coming up at 30. Yeah. You get all the free yeah. Chinese food samples that you want. Yeah, you get tired of it after a while. So. <laughs> mm. All right, Marcus, we're going to gonna start our regular show. You can sit over there and yes listen sir. to the phone calls through there. And, uh, yeah, we'll talk to you towards the end, maybe. Yes, sir. Marcus from Atlanta in the house. Oh, it was just for pre-show. He's still in the house, though. I'm going to headsets. All right, guys, coming up. Stand by. Hey, Danny, hi. 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 This is your captain speaking. We are making our descent into Las Vegas McCarran Airport. On behalf of our crew, we'd like to thank you for flying MMA Junkie Airlines. Now please fasten your seatbelts and put your tray tables in your upright position because the descent is going to be a little bit bumpy. <laughs> All right, Junkie Nation, it's time to roll, baby, on MMA Junkie Radio with gorgeous George and Ghost. This is what we do and why we do it, baby. All night long, we roll it! Yes! The MMA Junkie Radio Revolution is upon us. Can you dig it? There's no escape. No escape. Through the vast frontier of cyberspace, and through a sea of stars in outer space. One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. We've solidified our combat communication stranglehold. We are controlling transmission. With the use of MMA Junkie Radio and Sirius XM satellite radio technology. MMA Junkie Radio. Commence transmission. <laughs> Live from MMA Junkie Radio HQ in the fight capital of the world, Las Vegas, Nevada. Here are your hosts, Gorgeous George and Goes. From the fight capital of the world, inside the beautiful Mandalay Bay Racing Sportsbook, and a remote location in the southwest of Las Vegas, you are listening to the MMA Junkie Radio Show, the only show that matters. Hit it, Goes. I'm your host, Gorgeous George. With me as always is the devious and dastardly goes our east co-host dan tom our latest adu- uh addition to the show hovering in and out of the camera and of course danny otto back with us after i believe a vacation or some gigs he's back east what's up guys what up welcome back danny thanks it's good to be back i didn't even know he was gone wow danny what were we going for i went to comic-con oh that's right you did say that all right cool well i hope you had a good time yeah it was awesome thanks yeah Geeks galore? Yeah, it was uh, Thursday, not so bad. Um, it was it was crowded, but it was kind of what I expected. 
But by Saturday, I, c I just couldn't move. I gave up a couple hours into it by Saturday. What about outside mm -hmm. your group of friends? Were there a lot of geeks there? Like, just in <laughs> general, like the public? Wow. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it was packed with everyone. No, like, for I'd those like of us that get that... For those of us that get laid, explain to us like, what, what <laughs> happens at these <laughs> conventions. Like, what are they like? You know, is, is it all about dressing up as sci-fi figures or two-hour lines? With you know, wh how, what's it like? The the way I see, it, you named two of the biggest things there. Yeah, everyone's dressing up. I didn't dress up as anything. This was my first time ever going, uh, so I kind of just wanted to take everything in. But uh, I did stand on a lot of lines. Uh, which seemed to be the theme of the day. Sounds like a blast so yeah. far. Yeah, St stood mm -hmm. on lines. What else? And, uh, but, I mean, they had a lot of panels like where they would premiere stuff. Like I know a lot of the trailers got premiered early there, and, and they had a lot of panels with like the cast and crew of certain movies and a lot of stuff like that. And then they had uh, a, a whole section that was just like this artists. This weekend, folks, was UFC 216 <laughs> wow. and wow. Bellator 184. <laughs> And we're going to recap the hell out of it. We got a couple new world champions. Tony Ferguson is the new UFC lightweight interim champ. That's the 155-pound division that is ruled by Conor McGregor. Uh, however, I think Tony picked up a lot of steam this weekend. He's putting pressure on the Irishman to unify. And he's got the backing of the UFC president. Demetrius Johnson broke the record for most title defenses. The flyweight who has reigned over that division for a while as well, close to five years, I believe. He now uh, has 11 title defenses, and he looks spectacular. He just keeps getting better and better. And, of course, you may, you heard me say ch new champions is in plural. Don't forget, Bellator got to give them some love. They had a couple good fights on their 184 card that I caught. Uh, unfortunately, good friend of the show, Daniel Strauss, lost to Emmanuel Sanchez, who was very, very impressive. Kudos to him and Darian Caldwell is now the new world champion in the Bantamweight division at Bellator MMA. So congrats to him. He soundly beat Eduardo Dantas. 866-522-2846 uh, is the number to call in if you want to react to any of that. And, of course, the news that kind of came along with UFC 216, which uh, was in Las Vegas. Uh, Vegas still recovering from the tragic events from the week before. So that, that definitely came into play, and uh, we'll touch on some of that. But, you know, on fight night, oh, excuse me, within 24 hours of the event, 36 hours actually to be a little bit more accurate, we lost two fights. Lentz, uh, Nick Lentz versus Will Brooks. Nick Lentz fell off. He fell ill. Had trouble with uh, the weight cutting issues. With the weight cutting, I should say. Had issues with weight cutting. And then on fight day, Derek Lewis uh, re-injured what, I believe I've heard is and, and confirmed now is a back injury. So that was unfortunate. So it was a little bit of a reshuffle to that event. Walt Harris stepped up to fight for Brees Verdum. Mark Godbeer was left without a fight. And then goes this morning, I was perusing Junkie, and I saw there was a little bit of a scrum with Francis Ngannou. He said he was ready to go, man. So I don't know who he would have stepped up to. I don't know if it would have been worth it for him to step up to Godbeer because Harris was stepping up to Verdum or if he was willing to fight Verdum. That would have been something else. And Verdum took his time in another article that I read on Junkie. He took his time making that decision versus Harris. He didn't just accept it right away. So who knows if he would have accepted Francis Ngannou. But crazy stuff happening behind the scenes. That's why we'll talk to Simon Samano, our latest addition to the Junkie editorial team. He's one of the uh, editors on the site. He'll join us in about half an hour. We also will talk to two of the bonus winners from... UFC 216, a performance of the night winner in John Moraga, who starched Magomed Tov, and Bobby Green back in action. Uh, took home a fight of the night bonus, 50 Gs. It was a draw versus Lando Venata, but still he pre he seemed pretty ecstatic uh, that he came away with uh, at least not losing and some money. So we'll talk to them. They will both appear in the second hour. In the meantime, guys. Let me borrow something that I see from inside uh, the NFL on Tuesdays when I watch it. They always say, what What did we learn this week? So I don't want to completely phrase it like that, Ooh. but what stood out to you guys on Saturday the most? Maybe Easy. one or two topics or, or if something just stood out. Easy. The one thing that stood out for me was there is no question. Demetrius Johnson is the pound-for-pound pound king in my eyes of mixed martial arts. Mm -hmm. How about you, Dan? Dan uh, Tom? I learned that never 
ever expect a fight card to be what it is. Just show up and enjoy whoever steps in that cage. Yeah. I would say the thing that stood out to me the most was uh, the from, from the Ferguson-Lee fight. The, I guess hovering around the topic of just the weight cutting, I think it has to have been... You know, with, with 36-hour weigh-ins instead of 24 hours, I thought we were going to see, you know, better recovery and things like that. But I, I think a lot of it still has to do with um, no IVs, you know, to be able to recover. Uh, and, and just the fact that I, I feel like we're skimming along here. And luckily, we've avoided something serious on the UFC stage. But I, I, uh, I really want to see 65 and 75 and 95 so that we can have 115 pounds all the way to 205 pounds because that that's pretty sad man to see people um have to either pull out or you know stagger to the finish line and let them let that affect them the next day uh we just you know it's not boxing it's it's just 10 pounds that we're asking but i really think it's in the end it's it's going to be uh the safer thing i think it'll help george but, uh, but i i mm -hmm. Man, I feel like no matter what we do, fighters are just going to push the limits, okay? It, it's kind of right. life. If, if you go to work every day at 9 a.m. and you're late every now and again, they go, guess what? We're going to let you, we're going to give you like a 10-minute buffer. You think you'll still come in on time? You're going to push that limit, right? And you're going to push it a little right, bit more. Right. I think it's just kind of uh, human nature, but especially in, for in sports and competitive sports like that. Fighters are just going to push the limits, and if you bump up the weight classes, they're just going to do the same shit in a different weight class, I think. But I think it will help well, a couple weight classes that are kind of those, you know, where the 15 gap, I think it'll help them the most. But I think just overall, mm -hmm. uh, fighters are just always going to push it. They're always, always going to do that. It'll help the UFC. The UFC will have an extra belt for them to promote. Um, and here's the thing. You are completely right. I think people still push the boundaries. But luckily, guys like Cerrone, Masvidal, Whitaker... They're proving to Dos Anjos, they're proving to us that if you have the skill set, you may have to give a, give up a few pounds here and there. But for the most part, most of these fights are pretty winnable. And the other thing is, if they do send you up to the other one, now they're only sending you up 10 pounds, not 15, or in some cases 20, where that's what the fighters, I believe, uh, it's pretty clear cut to them. Wow, I'm really, really at a disadvantage here. So... Um, you, you know, like, you, you're right, because a lot of people will, will still continue to do it. But but I think the sport is evolving, much like the lower the lower leg ca calf kicks. We're seeing a lot of that. I think we're going to see a lot of the fighters realize that uh, a 100% me is better than an 85% bigger me, you know, in a, in a smaller weight class. Regardless, let's jump to the top here before we're going to take a quick, we're going to kind of realign the commercials. We're going to hit one pretty soon. I, I want to get your guys' thoughts. On the main event, Tony Ferguson was versus Kevin Lee. Dan Tom, what'd you think? Uh, uh, can I touch on something on the weight cutting real quick? I wanted to add since you, you sure. it just was it just was you you sparked something with what you, with what you said that originally got us talking about it was you guys. I'm not going to rehash. I agree. 165. I agree. Guys should move up. I agree. Guys are still going to push limits. I agree. But if we're comparing the morning weigh-ins to the afternoon weigh-ins, because there's a considerable jump of incidents. What is it? Is it is it the fact that guys are having to weight cutting was hard enough to do it right or to do it wrong? It was hard enough in the first place that adding a wake up time, putting a tighter limit on when they can make a, make the window of weight is that affecting it? And I guess what I would ask is anybody who is around like this may this be a great question to ask Bert next time we get him in here when they had those afternoon weigh-ins. We all hear well it was miserable. The fighters were waiting hours to weigh in, and I agree that must have been miserable, right? But while they were waiting, were those hours that they had to wait, guys? Did that give time for Kevin Lee's for all these different people that are struggling to make the time limit towards you know drama every morning was that window useful for those people and that's why we just weren't hearing it we weren't hearing about it as much so in other words maybe this was going on the whole time we just didn't hear about it as much before maybe. I don't know it's just food for thought well, that, that's a good thing I think we're due for a follow-up with with a Burt Watson um, I've heard both you know both sides of it the waiting around and I want to get rehydrated and, and, and a lot, you know, so many people love the extra time. And, um, and then of course there's others I had adjusting to being on weight the night before cause they don't want to deal with it in the morning. And me, I, you know, I was saying yesterday and I believe on our broadcast on sportscaster and thank you to everybody that tuned in. I want to start just pushing for Thursday night, 48 hours. 
Uh, and I think it, we, we also came up with some scenarios where it may help the situation where if someone doesn't weigh in, we still have 48 hours for someone to plug in if they have their medicals and their weight is on. So who knows? The sport keeps changing. It's different. We're still in the leather helmet stages. I thought at 20 years I would throw that term out the window, but I still realize that stuff happens in this sport that seems primitive at times, and I, I believe it will continue to evolve, Dan. Yep, yep, yep. But you, you were talking about uh, Tony Ferguson, Kevin Lee. That was just a uh, – boy, that was just a crazy fight. Uh, crazy fight. I mean, it, you know, bittersweet because, you know, we obviously have a relationship with Lee, but it was a great fight at, at the end of it. I, I don't think anybody can take that away, right? No, nah, I thought it was yeah, a really good both fight. both guys competed. Yeah, they were classy. Ghost, what do you think? Well, it was a great fight. I, I enjoyed watching it. Um, it was back and forth. But the one thing that I wanted to come out of this fight was somebody that just stood there and you said, that guy right there is going to give the champion a nightmare. And I think both guys showed that, especially with Conor McGregor's skill set, Conor is probably going to be a nightmare for them at certain points. You know, Tony's still taking big shots. He took some big shots from, from Kevin. And Conor's power has been a little bit unforgiving uh, so far. So if he's going to take a shot like that or be willing to take a shot like that from Conor, I don't know that that's a good idea. He's got to figure out a way to get these victories without going through those little stages where he takes a big shot from his opponent and then has to weather the storm. Uh, Kevin, mm -hmm. on the other hand, I like everything Kevin said in, in defeat. You know, he knows he's got a lot of work to do. He's got to go back and and fix those things and I feel like Kevin's not his stock's really not going to drop too much he can get right back into it especially the way he is a uh, little brash a little trash talk question is how much is he going to do of that because it's hard to trash talk when you just kind of got served up right by by Tony Ferguson so w it'll be interesting to see which direction Kevin goes but I I'd like to actually see both guys get a little bit of rest because they were in a hell of a battle mm -hmm. right and I'll just say this before we go to our first break what I liked that came out of Saturday night is I feel like, uh, obviously, Connor is sitting at the table, and he has two aces, and he's showing them to everybody before the flop comes. Uh, there's the UFC. There's the other lightweights that are also sitting at the table. But coming out of that night, I thought, you know, both guys competed very well. I thought the fans were pretty happy. You know, there was a result, which was obviously Tony winning. But I felt like they, 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 they made some moves towards a little bit of a pushback, and I like the fact that now it looks like, the champions will unify. I mean, even UFC President Dana White saying that's the fight to make, not Nate Diaz. So I think a lot of us hardcores, that's kind of what we want. And then they can revisit Conor versus Nate Diaz, whether it's for a title or not. Those two obviously dislike each other. They fought at 170 pounds, so there was no title there, and, and the fight will still be big. But at least it kind of gives us some clarity on, on the sporty side of things versus the business side of things. All right, let's take this uh, break real fast. You're listening to MMA Junkie Radio on Sirius 6 7 Rush 93. When we come back, we'll do a run of calls, 866-522-2846. See how you all react to UFC 216, Bellator 184, anything else that's on your mind. Stay close, folks.
charm, compassion, common sense. These guys have none of that. You listen to them, so you're no better. I am awesome, though. They are gorgeous, George and Goes. Whether your punk ass lost your fantasy football game and need to vent about it, or you want to brag after a big win, the place to do it is SiriusXM Fantasy Sports Radio. Reaction to Week 5 in fantasy football can be heard right now on Sirius 210, XM87, and on the SiriusXM app. That same SiriusXM app houses the MMA Junkie Radio Show along with much of the content that you hear on the Rush 93 channel. So check it out. Download it. It's one of the many ways that you can catch the show commercial free and in HD quality. All right, so let's continue here with uh, recapping UFC 216. I'm going to give you guys just a couple little bits of info from the card, and then we'll go to the phone call. So now's the time to get in the queue. 866-522-2846. Uh, UFC 216 took, took place Saturday night at the T-Mobile Arena. By the way, kudos to the UFC for the tributes that they had uh, in regards to the mass shooting that took place the week before. Um, you know, the moments of silence and many of the uh, announcers and the fighters from the organization uh, sharing their thoughts at this horrible tragedy and, of course, you know, the, the Vegas strong movement. I, I really applaud them for that. So hats off to the Ultimate Fighting Championship. 10,638 were in attendance. The total gate was 677,999. I know those kind of don't match up, but the UFC... Gave away a lot of tickets to first responders, many of the uh, ci civic workers, civil workers that were involved, uh, many people that assisted and, and their stories came to light, and many of those uh, v victims and their family and friends. So I, you know, the president of the UFC was very clear about the fact that this card wasn't about the gate or anything else. It was about the beginning of the healing process, and um, that's why those numbers don't match up and lastly let me just give you the salaries that i kind of alluded to pointed out earlier uh, and then we'll get to the calls tony ferguson took home 500 g's 250,000 was a win bonus kevin lee 250 to show up demetrius johnson 370,000 no win bonus ray borg 100,000 let me add that demetrius johnson did share that this would be the first fight he would get pay-per-view points so that'll be 370 and some pay-per-view points what that'll net him, I'm not sure. Fabrice Silver Doom, 400,000. 125,000 was a win bonus. The fact that he was contemplating it, <laughs> fuck, man. Uh, I, you're in shape. You're taking on a guy who's not at Lewis's level, didn't prepare for you. As much as you didn't prepare for him, he didn't prepare for you. And you might be turning away 400 Gs. I, I, I don't know, man. He, he must be well off or something because in the end, it was the right decision. But when you look at these numbers, you start to think, Bro, you thought about it? Yeah. Anyway, um, Walt Harris, 28000 And my hat's off to Walt Harris as well for stepping up. That's not an easy assignment. This guy's a former uh, world champion. He's in the talk of uh, greatest heavyweight of all time, you know, along with Fedor and Kane and Stipe and the others. So, uh, Walt Harris, come back. You know, I know he's been working hard, man, but uh, Verdun was on. Uh, Mara Romero. Romero Barella got 24,000, 12 and 12. Kalinda Faria, 12. Benil Dariush and Evan Dunham, uh, 48 and 40 respectively. No win bonus on either side because it was a draw. Uh, Cody Stamen, 24,000. He got 12 and 12. Tom Ducanwa, uh 23,000. Bobby Green, 24,000. Lando Venata, 25,000. No win bonus for either guy, but they both share 100,000. They each got 54, fight of the night. Poliana Botelio, uh, 20,000, 10 and 10. Pro Gonzalez, 10. Matt Schnell, 20, 10 and 10. Marco Beltran, 14,000. John Moraga, 68 Gs. He got 34,000 uh, of that was a winning bonus. So 34 and 34 plus a performance of the night, 50 Gs. Magomed Biblatov, 17,000. Uh, Brad Tavares, 74,000, 37, 37. And Talis Aitis, 57,000. Again, when a fight ends in a draw, no bonuses are given. And I'm wondering, is there an equation where they can get something? Because they didn't lose. I think they do. You know, and the money's already been budgeted. So uh, how about, a, how about a, a discretionary bonus or something, a pat on the back? I don't know. But I, th I think these fighters 
deserve something, you know, yeah. in case of a draw? Especially you know, when I'd it, like to get your guys' thoughts on that. Draw. It was an entertaining fight. Right. It's not like right. it stunk up the place and it ended up a draw. I mean, we were all entertained. They went out there and they did what they were supposed to do. It just just didn't work out. I have to imagine the UFC does make that right in some way somehow, right? So, Well, I guess my thought is unless they're willing to put something in place, then they're going to rely on the kind of backroom bonus feel that we used to have. The, the problem is it's not how it used to be, though, right, guys? I mean, or, 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 or is it? I mean, well, not every draw is created equally, too, right? So that's that true. might be the way for them to go is just for them to decide behind the scenes what those guys deserve. And I'm okay with that, but it yeah. just seems like they're moving away f more from that, uh, I don't want to say mafia-like approach, but, you know, the more Vegas approach, taking care of your own kind of a thing. What do you mean by that, right. mafia feel? Like, uh, you know, giving an envelope. Like they're just mobsters here to... Oh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I, if I didn't mention it, Demetrius Johnson got the other performance of the night. So there's your four or $50,000 bonuses. All right. Let's go to the phone calls. 866-522-2846. Uh, we have no VX in place. So Danny, guide us. Who do we got? We have Samson in Cali. What's up, Samson? How you doing? What's up, George and Goes, man? I'm excited. First time caller. I listen to you guys for a long time. I have my uh, I listen to you guys every uh, every day when I'm driving my kids around, and uh, my three year old will sing the opening song. I listen to you guys all the time. Love it, Love right your on, man. What, what what what's your kid's name? Uh, my three year old's Kellen, and I have a little boy named Liam. And uh, yeah, every day they'll they'll sing along with the opening guy. Like um, all the open, all they, they say everything the opening radio guy says. <laughs> but, uh, That's awesome. Shout out to Kellen and Liam. Uh, Samson, yeah. and we appreciate your support and, and you calling in, man. What's on your mind, brother? What, what, do we, what do you want to talk about? Well, first of all, huge fan of Bobby Green. I'm so glad uh, he stopped this losing streak and he, you know, performed. Uh, obviously, I'm a little biased, but I think he won. But uh, killer fight. Um, uh, as for 216, um, I... I wanted to. I, I always kind of thought Kevin Lee wasn't ready. Um, I mean, I know he's a big uh, supporter of the show, but uh, I just it kind of proved to me on two sixteen that you know what I thought was kind of true. He just wasn't ready. Uh, I hope they open up a one sixty five for him though. I think he'll be good there. Um, one thing I always wanted to ask you guys though is if you guys can give me a couple of matchups that you either always wanted to see or just. Or hopefully, uh, you can see one day. Uh, right. Like overall in mixed martial arts ever, or just uh, like current day? Yeah, like like for instance, I we, I've always wanted to see Pat Barry fight at two hundred five. Uh, I always wanted to see Connor versus like Edson Barbosa. Just just a fight mm -hmm. that you've always wanted to see, uh -huh. and uh, whether or not they make it or or even be possible these uh, nowadays. Yeah, I mean, the one I always point to kind of goes back a little bit, but I always wanted to see Don Fry and Marco Huas go at it at, at the, in their primes. How about you guys? Okay. Um, my matchup, I guess, if that's a question, like matchups that could have been that never came together, I, I can't help but uh, think about the old poster that used to be in here, the shoot. Ooh, Randy Couture Randy versus Fedor Emelianenko. Uh, Fedor. That's what I'm talking about, Samson. That's a damn good one. Top yeah, that's a damn good yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. George, you're kind of up against uh, it here. Let's see here. What's that? You're in trouble. Those are two good ones. Yeah, no, I I am. All right, you know what? So the other day on the Underground, a uh, popular forum that I've visited for many years, they were talking about heavyweights, you know, who's the greatest of all time, and I didn't want to get into it. I was too fucking lazy. But I, what I finally wrote was I think Fedor had the best run, um, but I think the best case for actually coming up with an answer is pretty – it just takes a while to, to get through it all. But I think the names that it should be considered are Fedor, Kane, Verdum, Stipe right now. Uh, so you know who I, I really just kind of want to see at this point is mm -hmm. Kane and uh, Stipe. But uh, I guess Kane and Fedor, just to kind of finish out the, the, the little triangle before Stipe came along, where those three were always talked about, Verdum, Kane, and, and Fedor, uh, like a prime Fedor versus prime Kane would have been really nice because, um, you know, Kane, Kane's problem was the injuries and, he had multiple matchups with Bigfoot and and uh, and Junior DeSantos, so we didn't see him with like a der diverse ledger like the other guys. Uh, modern day, I've always really wanted to see two gangsters lock it up, and that's George Masvidal and Nick Diaz. I'd love to yeah, see what that trash talk would be yeah. like. I'd Those two just in the center of the cage. I'd pay, pay sixty dollars just for that fight. 
Yep. Yeah, and you know, uh, uh, obviously, it's it may not happen now because the guys are moving around in weight class, but um, it just just for the trash talk. Obviously, the fight I think would still be good, but just for the trash talk, Kevin Lee and Conor McGregor. I mean, that that would be fun to see those two go at it. But Samson, we got to move on, my man. Great question, uh, and thanks for participating. Call in more often. We really appreciate your support. Who's next, Danny? Next up, we got Marco and Waco. D uh, what's up, Marco? How you doing? Marco from Waco Road to Paso Altos. Hey. Not Vegas much, strong, man. Guys. Vegas strong. Thank That's you. Uh, right. Thanks, Marco. Uh, first of all, uh, everybody bow down to the mightiest mouse, man. What do we call that move, man? The German super slash amber, flying amber. Is that the mighty amber, like he called it? You cannot even. I like put it. That, you cannot even put that move on a video game, dude. I mean, shit. He, even if you scripted the motherfuckers on the WWE, can pull that shit off. Yeah, <laughs> that was sick. Right, because was, it's it's not like the flying arm bars we've seen, you know, in, in grappling tournaments. I mean, in the end. It was a flying arm bar, but it's all set up from wrestling, you know, and and so he, the, the fact that he was able to blend those two, I like the mighty arm bar. Dan, have you thought of a a, a, a creative name? Well, I, I like the mighty arm bar and the mouse trap, but I will I like say wh 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 whether uh, depending. Ooh, the mouse trap's yeah, good too. Regardless of what you want to call the arm bar part of it, let's be honest, that was a rock bottom to start it off, right, guys? Yeah. So the rock might have some say so. <laughs> yeah, there's a rock bottom to start it off. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, I, I I got. I'm out of superlatives to to go whatever whatever the ass whooping was. I might have put some Ray Borg, man. Kudos for Ray Borg for toughing it out. But wow, that was that was impressive, man. The numbers, the the, the amount of punches that he put on on board before the finish, man. The the punch differential was unreal. Hey, one last thing, guys. You know, kudos to Banara and Green and also Donan and Terry Huge for the the draws. And uh, I got a I got a, a question for you. When was the last time you guys saw a boating draw? I remember Bigfoot versus Han, awesome. Maynard versus uh, Frankie Edgar, freaking awesome. Goodly Thompson one was freaking amazing. Every time we get a draw, is because somebody gets their ass kicked on the first or second round, and then you saw an amazing comeback. So most of the time, draws are freaking exciting. So give me more draws if they're going to be fights like that. Peace out, guys. All right, mm. see you, Marco. Yeah. Um... Hmm. Well, I was going to give mean, a prize to the best call in boxing so far. too. I was going to give that? a prize to the best call so far, but uh, yeah, it's kind of a draw. It's Mark a draw. seems to like those, so fuck it. <laughs> we just won't give a prize away. Danny, how are we looking on calls? Uh, those are the only two we had right now. All right, those are the only two for right now. Uh, guys, let's just mosey through the card here. We talked a little bit about Ferguson Lee. If you have any thoughts, please share them. But otherwise, Demetrius Johnson, record-breaking performance. Is he the GOAT uh, yes. in your guys' yep. eyes? Yes, absolutely. He is the goat that I just can't even figure out a way to art. The only thing I can think of is let's see how Daniel Cormier's career ends up shaping up because really the damage that he did in two divisions is pretty insane. But Demetrius mm -hmm. Johnson is just beasting on people, man. Now he's getting all these finishes. So, uh, yeah, he is in my eyes. How about you, Dan? Man, Dan John, jo John Jones started to win me over, but I am back at my original argument for Demetrius Johnson because uh, the creativity was the one field, I believe, aside from competition, of course, that's the big cr crux in the argument, but the creativity, Johnson showed he is on, if not surpassed Jones in that, and I will remind everybody, pound for pound was started with vehicles, okay? That's where this term comes from. So the idea is you want the torque of a V8, but you want the pickup of a four-cylinder, you want the durability of a, you know what I'm saying, you want the, the mobility of a sports car it's it, it's it's who can blend all the attributes into one the best that happy medium and by that definition demetrius johnson stands alone ladies and gentlemen right you know i'll say this uh whatever happens with john jones will have a big say in the direction that this conversation goes in for the next couple years if john jones uh definitely his appeal is doesn't come through and you know we Basically, we all accept the fact that I guess he cheated, for lack of better words. Then I think Cormier comes into play because how do you count those losses against him, you know, against the guy that was enhanced? Um, Demetrius is in the lead for sure right now. Now, I heard some good cases for Anderson Silva and some of the things he did. And, of course, GSP comes back. And if GSP comes back, many people have called him the greatest, and that's without winning a second title in the second weight class. Imagine if he can do that. He'll be in the talk. So the thing is, 
this topic will be hot for the next few months. Now, if Jones comes back and his his appeal, uh, you know, comes through favorably for him, then obviously you have to include him in in that talk uh, uh, of greatest of all time because the Cormier fights would be, uh, I guess, legit in that case. So that, along with GSP, and then how about, you know, Conor McGregor? You just never know what's up with him, but there's always been that 5% chance that he could go up in weight class yet again, and if he did and won a third title, I mean, that yeah. kind of smashes a, <laughs> a lot of what some of the other guys are doing. So that's going to be fun here as we'll talk about that, you know, uh, over the next year or so, as long as Demetrius is fighting at a high level. However, John Jones, that comes out. Whatever happens to GSP and Conor McGregor, it should be pretty, pretty fun. Cody Garbrandt, what if he drops to 25 and beats a GOAT in Demetrius Johnson and now claims his title? So he's got to get past Dillashaw, but, I mean, he's clamoring at the shot to drop. Usually the guys want to go up, and he's clamoring at the shot to go down and do it. Um, maybe too soon for him because he's only 11-0, but still a world champion, undefeated. Yeah, it makes you it know, fun, pretty though. strong stuff there this as well. This talk makes it fun. Yep, yep. It does. It does. Uh, Fabrice Verdum, congrats to him. I did see him, you know, talk about wanting his, uh, his broadcasting gig back. And as I noted in the Sportscaster broadcast that we had on Saturday night, I still feel like there's some repairing to do. I don't want to get into it now, but congrats on the win for Fabrice Verdum. And the best thing he can do is just line himself up on that timeline with what Nganu and Overeem are doing. Or, or make sure that when Stipe does come back, he's he's on one of those cards. You, you never know when you can fill in or at least be on the same timeline as those ahead of you. Uh, impressive performance by Mara Barella, Benil Dariush. I mean, he came close to finishing that fight in the first round. But Evan Dunham did come back and win those last two rounds. Dariush faded a little bit, but uh, I know some people thought Dariush may have pulled it out. But I, I think that was the right call. Congrats to Cody Stamen. Uh, land, uh, excuse me, Poliana, Botello, and Matchnell also getting wins. But Nat and Green, I'll go over it one more time. That was a, a draw differently, though, because it was a point deduction here versus the 10-8 the variety that we saw in the Dariush fight. Uh, he basically need a grounded opponent, although upon further review, it was the soft tissue from the, thi from the thigh, but still by definition, I think that was the right call. Uh, Venata didn't argue it. He kind of realized it when it happened. Bobby Green came back to win the last two rounds. And it could be that the, that last flurry in round three won him round three. So very clutch for Bobby Green to be fighting like that all the way to the finish line. John Moraga just blasted Magomed Bebelatov uh, on the prelims. And congrats to Brad Tavares. He didn't get the finish, but boy, did he steamroll Talos Leitis. I mm -hmm. thought it was a, a, a statement win. A couple 30-26s for him. Beautiful jab and nice usage of that lower leg calf kick. Um, let's take a break, guys. When we come back, we'll talk to one of the uh, assistant editors on MMA Junkie, Simon Samano. He's our latest addition to our stable of fine writers and editors. He'll join us. He was in Vegas last week, so he saw a lot of things behind the scenes, being that he was up there, you know, up, up close for uh, all the, the weight drama, the, the pullouts from some of the fighters. That didn't sound right. And, and, of course, on fight night, he was there at the T-Mobile Arena. All right, folks, stay close. You're listening to MMA Junkie Radio on Sirius XM, Rush 93.
King Kong Hello. has a lot of shit on them. Like a lot. Especially Goes. They are gorgeous George and Goes. Sirius XM presents an exclusive subscriber-only event, The Eagles, live at the Grand Old Opry. You can win a trip to Nashville and front row tickets. For more information and to enter, go to SiriusXM.com slash Eagles before October 19th. No additional purchase is necessary. Danny, turn it up for like 15 seconds. I like that song. I mean, it's just Simon on old, right? Yeah. Trust me, Simon's jamming to this, too. It is. I got his John Cena shirt on right now. Wait, what is he just in the air? <laughs> All right, folks. Simon Samano, assistant editor over at MMA Junkie and, of course, USA Today Sports. He's going to join us. Now, uh, follow him on Twitter, at SJ Samano. He was in Vegas for Fight Week. What's up, Simon? How you doing? What's up? What's up, guys? How you guys doing? Good, thank you. Were you jamming to the song? You feeling it? Of course I was jamming to Ski Low, man. <laughs> that was new. Just checking. <laughs> Just checking. <All> right. <laughs> that was new. I, had a kid, I remember I had, a kid, I had a kid on my Little League team uh, way back in the day who was like the shortest kid on the team. And he used to always sing that song, so oh, yeah? that's like my memory of that song from back in the day, yeah. <laughs> there you go. Simon, so you were in uh, Las Vegas for UFC 216. What stood out to you the most uh, between, obviously, the mood of the city from what had happened one week prior versus, I guess, the sporting event that you attended? Uh, was there one of the two that stood out more or? Yeah, so Vegas, um, it, it felt it felt different. You know, it felt really different. And, you know, I, I really hope uh, I really hope the city and you guys, as well as being residents there, all three of you. Uh, you know, I hope you guys are doing well and recovering from everything that happened last week. Um, it was a different vibe. You know, the strip was when I got there on Wednesday. Uh, things felt different on the strip. It was like the quietest I think I've ever seen it. Like on a Wednesday afternoon, things start to pick up, but it was pretty bare. Um, so there was just this kind of weird energy, uh, I think all week. And I think we were sort of trying to figure out initially, you know, how are we going to ask these fighters, you know, how they're feeling. It just felt weird that we were there to cover fighting, you know, um, on Saturday when something had just happened a few days earlier and it, it just made fighting a little trivial, but we had to continue on. We had to do our job. So, um, you know, I thought a lot of the fighters, um, even on Wednesday, they they had a lot of good things to say. It was clearly weighing on 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 everyone's mind, specifically, you know, on Kevin Lee and Evan Dunham, um, who were made available to us at Media Day. You know, those guys being Las Vegas residents, um, and Benil Dariush. It seemed to affect him really uh, a lot as well. Um, you know, uh, so it was strange. It was a really weird feeling. I'm not going to lie, guys. It was, it, was, it was odd. But as the week progressed and we got closer to fighting, uh, you know, again, there was just, we had to go about our business and continue on. So, uh, you know, the show must go on, I guess, as they say. Right. And it and did. Simon, and I thought UFC 216 was good. Your father also a Vegas resident. Uh, hopefully everything's good. I think you have, we have exchanged texts and you told me that everything's good. But I'm talking about uh, the recovery from it, you know, um, He's also a Vegas resident, so shout out to him yeah. uh, as well. Hopefully, you had a chance to see him. Um, yeah. I now moving on. Now moving on to the fights. Uh, let's start with the title fights: Tony Ferguson versus Kevin Lee. Uh, we knew. I guess we had. No, you know, I don't know. Kevin does a great job of convincing everybody. Hey, I'm 25. I'm young. I can do this. You know. But now looking back, and of course with his own admit admins uh, in the post fight uh, press conferences. That way cut, you know, it really, really deteriorated his play. But in no way do I want to say that that, uh, that it wouldn't have been Tony Ferguson's night anyway because Tony Ferguson fought amazing. It was a great fight. Uh, your thoughts on the main event, please. Yeah, Kevin, Kevin Lee didn't make any excuses about it either. Um, you know, I, I know he, he obviously talked about what he went through because we asked him, you know, we asked him after the fight how he was feeling. And he had he obviously shared that with us. But he made it very clear that the weight cut, he was not going to use that as an excuse. And he didn't. In no way did he, you know, hint that that was the reason why things went down. Um, I, thought, I thought that Kevin, he, he fought really well. He held his own. 
he came in there really aggressive, and he knocked Tony around a little bit in the first round. Like, he felt he fought good enough, fought well enough to, you know, put him in, in some really tough situations. But um, I do think at the end of the day, you know, experience sort of caught up uh, to Tony in that instance. He underestimated, I'm sorry, caught up to Kevin. Uh, you know, Tony um, just just rebounded, you know, made adjustments, um, and Kevin just was not, he just wasn't prepared to deal with, with Tony on the ground. And that's why we ultimately saw the finish that we did. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, I, I think with Kevin, though, I do think we're going to see him as a world champion someday. I mean, he is, he's got an it factor. He is incredibly talented. But it, it really just was not his time. A little too much, a little too soon, I think, for him. Was there a little bit of a surprise in the back room when Dana White stated that it, his preference now is to unify Tony Ferguson's interim belt with Conor McGregor's belt? Rather than some of the rumors that have been being thrown around where Connor would fight Nate and then Tony would have to either, uh, you know, play off of that or maybe uh, entertain a Habib Nurmagomedov fight. Uh, what did you guys think upon hearing that? Yeah, I mean, it's hard. It's really hard to, you know, it's hard to believe uh, Dana right now. I mean, it, he says one thing, but, you know, we've seen how uh, other things, you know, happen. Um Take, for instance, what's going on with GSP and Bissing. We thought the ship had sailed, and then just, you know, a few days later, uh, we find out that fight's happening. So, um, and it's going to happen next month. So, I'd like to think that's what Dana truly believes. But at this point, guys, uh, you know, it, it's ultimately, uh, you can't tell Conor McGregor what to do. You have to try to get him on board with this. So, I hope that Dana has the pull to say to Connor, hey, this is the thing to do. I think, like, I think Dana wants to unify the belts. I don't think Dana wants to get too far away. I don't think he wants to get too far away from just letting Connor do what he wants, however he wants to. But at the end of the day, you know, it's going to be a request. You've got to try to get Connor on board with this. And you know, I'm hoping Dana is able to do that. I think we all are, but I don't know that for sure it's going to happen next. Or maybe that was part of the negotiations for the Mayweather fight. Maybe he threw that in there at some point. We'll see. But I was happy to hear that, that he's more interested in that than Nate. You know, the Nate Diaz fight will be there regardless. It's not like the first two were title fights. Uh, I think it, it makes a ton of sense. But we'll see. We'll see because, like you said, uh, they've, they've definitely changed their course before. All right, let's talk about Demetrius Johnson versus Ray Borg, record-breaking 11th title defense, along with a bonus, hits the mighty arm bar in the fifth round. Was your jaw just dropping to the floor when you saw that? It happened right in front of me, guys. And, yes, I think you could even see uh, when he when he pulls that move off, uh, you'll see my mouth just drop. I'm right there. It happened right in front of me. I could not believe what I had just seen. That was just the most fluid thing, the most incredible thing. Mesmerizing is the word that I've been using to describe it on when I tweet about it or you know post about it. it. It absolutely was mesmerizing. Like, where did that even come from? Where did that even come from? Is he practicing that in the gym? Did he just pull that one out of his ass? Like, I, it was just incredible to watch. So um, that move, man. Like, I'd love to see if he can pull something off like that again. But he's just doing things on his own at this point. I mean, DJ is just. He's on a level that, that nobody else is on. It's that simple. I mean, he's just on a level that no one else is on. Um, and I don't, I don't think he's going to be slowing down anytime soon. You know, he's right there. He just crossed 30. He's in his prime. And it's crazy to think that we still have potentially, you know, several more years of Demetrius Johnson in his prime just on this level. I, I shudder to think what he's going to do, uh, you know, after this. Let me send it to the boys in the studio. Goes and Dan, what do you have for Simon Samanu? Simon, on that same topic, what do you feel like this fight did for his popularity amongst the fans and for Dana White? Do you feel like Dana White may have turned a little bit of a of corner when it comes to Demetrius Johnson now? So I, I think Dana did. He, he specifically, um, after the fight uh, in the post-fight press conference, you know, he kind of uh, apologized a little bit to DJ and to Borg because I think, you know, with the way everything went down with 
the whole Dillashaw and Demetrius Johnson thing, you know, Dana was obviously really pissed off and was very opinionated, as always, um, when DJ turned that down. But given the performance that Ray Borg put out there, and I, I definitely want to touch, this, touch on this real quick, Ray Borg has no reason to hang his head over what happened. I thought that kid fought really hard. I thought he fought great, actually, for who he like for where he's at as a 24 year old in this sport right now. He's going to bounce back someday. I think he's going to be a champion someday. But yeah, he deserves a lot of credit for really. He did his best to try and take that fight to Demetrius Johnson, and I think Dana, after seeing that performance and seeing it, said, "Okay, I was wrong." And he did. He said, "I was wrong about Borg." So I do think Dana. I do believe Dana uh, believes that Demetrius Johnson is the greatest of all time. Um, yeah. And I do think he's turned over a new leaf. Now, in terms of can that translate, you know, down the line with can his next fight be a pay-per-view main event? Uh, does he think he can sell Demetrius Johnson after this? There is an opportunity there. It's there because Demetrius Johnson just did something that blew us all away. So, you know, if you want to do something where you're getting that clip out there, and you're selling Demetrius as just this once in a generation fighter. It is there for the UFC to do it. I just don't, I don't I don't know for sure that that's going to happen, but the opportunity to me is there. I do think Demetrius did a lot for himself with this performance and specifically with that finisher. On on the business side of uh, of what's going on with Conor McGregor, is there even a little piece of you Simon that thinks maybe saying that the Tony Ferguson fight makes sense could be a negotiation tactic against Nate Diaz. Kind of a, hey, get your shit together because we have options. That's, you know, that's definitely something that has crossed my mind. I'm sure it's crossed, uh, it's obviously crossed your mind. I'm sure it's crossed quite a few people's minds because you just don't know, you know. We're in this era right now where the UFC seems to be doing what it perceives is best for business as opposed to, um, as opposed to, you know, doing what's right with the rankings and the contenders and who's all there. So uh, that definitely could be the case. But th you're not going to have a hard time selling Conor McGregor versus Tony Ferguson. I, I don't, I, that's not a hard fight to sell. And I think you have an opportunity here. Again, if you want to try to elevate another fighter, you know, to some status where he can then be, another mainstream type guy, another guy that not just the MMA fans know. Tony fits the bill. He fights exciting. He talks trash great. He, he, I mean, he's, he's, he's kind of a weird guy. You know, he's, he's, he's got his own char charisma and personality about him. So there are no shortage of, of, of clips, uh, of sound bites that he's going to give you. And you have all this footage of this guy just doing incredible things. I mean, he deserves this fight next. And I also think the UFC could benefit from it. This is the time right now to unify. I mean, it really is. And so uh, I'm hoping that it goes that way. You know, Simon, it's a perfect perfect uh, topic you're touching on right now. But I actually just wanted to touch on something back for real quick. Was just uh, I saw you in the replay of that Mighty Mouse thing. So hopefully they do replay that because we'll, we'll be able to see you in that replay as well. But uh, I guess we're going to break. But uh, I, I guess I was just, my my question was just about the 165 division. I feel that it was necessary. It was a good solution. It was a, a narrative and a talking point before the weight cutting issues. I guess was just wondering what the media's talk about that was backstage. I know Dana White shut it down on the press conference. You got 30 you know, seconds. We what do you think? First of all, we were confused when everything went down. I, I can tell you with the conversations that were going on in the weigh-in room uh, as everything was happening. But yes, that right there. Uh, that is something I think we as MMA media uh, members, we all agree on. 165 division is what's needed. Um, and, you know, uh, yes, that is, that is, that is the way uh, it should go down. But I, I don't see Dana changing his mind on this. I mean, he's changed his mind on other things. But I think they're worried about more title fights, watering down championships. Um, title fights equal more money. I got to jump in, Simon. I got to jump yeah, in because we're up against the clock. But thank you very much for your spot here on MMA Junkie Radio. And folks, we'll be right back after this break.
All right, here we go. It's the second hour of the MMA Junkie Radio Show. Danny's playing the jams today. I'm digging it. You are welcome. <laughs> Is that you guys? Those are your choices? Uh, no, that one was me. I don't know who did Ski Low. Was that you, Dan? Good that job, was me. Man. Yeah, it was a quiet guy over here. I, uh, I was taking credit for that one. Danny, please try Tony again. He's ready. Okay. All right. Just got a text there. Looks like we're be joined by UFC uh, lightweight champion, interim lightweight champion, Tony Ferguson here. Nice little surprise for you all. He, of course, beat Kevin Lee at UFC 216 on Saturday night. A triangle off of his, bla- uh, off of his back. Very impressive. Um, that work with Eddie Bravo definitely paying off. Uh, what an arsenal this guy has, right, guys, uh, oh. of tools, whether it's the stand-up or on the ground. I mean, you really have to account for a lot. Yeah, he's a video game character. That's basically what he is. That's how you would create a video game character. You would make him like him. Pretty much, yeah. Um, you know, the the jabs and, you know, he's he, 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 when he plants his feet, he can hurt you. When he's off balance, he can hurt you. When he's running towards you or away from you, he can hurt you. And again, on the ground, I mean, like Kevin said, look, the submission obviously did him in, but it was those elbows that crushed him too. So it must feel like you're fucking fighting a a, a Tasmanian devil. He's hitting you with everything. Uh, Joining us now on the show is UFC interim lightweight champion, Tony Ferguson. What's up, Tony? How you doing? (laughs) Good, guys. What's good, man? How you guys doing? Doing great, man. Congratulations on your win this Saturday night. I really enjoyed the fight, but more than anything, when you were talking to the gang on Fox Sports, the way you were embracing that belt, man, that was really touching for me as a hardcore MMA fan, as a member of the media that's covered you for a while. I love seeing that passion for the for the <laughs> fighters that want to be the best at what they do. So, so much in this era is focused around money fights and this and that. I just want to get paid. No, nah, man, you, 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 you struck something with me on Saturday night. Congratulations. Hey, thank you very much, man. Um, you know, first I want to say thank you, Vegas, for letting us uh, fight and compete. I know it's been a long week over there, but uh, we all banded together. We pulled strong, and, uh, you know, hopefully everybody enjoyed the fights, man, because I sure did. I'm sure Kevin did, too. He did, and it was cool to see uh, you two uh, embrace uh, some respect towards each other. I don't know if you caught his post-fight press conference, but, uh, you know, he definitely said you were the better man and, and, and definitely applauded your skills and, uh, talked about how he underestimated certain things, those elbows that I brought up earlier. So that that probably be, feels good too, you know, the the respect from up here. Absolutely. Um, that's why I, I didn't bring any animosity into this. Like I said, I was young once. Um, I had fun in there, man, and that was the whole point. The game plan was to let him use all that negativity and all that aggressiveness and just to weather the storm until he got tired. And my guard's a dangerous place to play, uh, especially with elbows. And uh, I said I was going to bring out the blades. Um, I kept them sharp, especially for this fight. And uh, I had a hell of a camp, man. It was an amazing experience. I'm excited. And uh, I'm, in, I'm in new. I'm the new. I can't believe it. And the awesome, new. Dude. That's right. The new UFC interim lightweight title. Now, uh, I think another another nice thing to hear for the purists is that Dana White really wants you versus Conor McGregor. You know, it, it, the last few months was dominated by, well, if Conor comes back, him versus Nate, the trilogy, this, that, whatever. But... I like that there's a there's a, at least a push initially here, fresh off of your fight, fresh off of determining who the interim lightweight champ is, which is you, since you defeated Kevin Lee, that now uh, a unification bout might be next. Your thoughts? I think it's amazing. Uh, he needs to defend his AK. You guys heard my post speech. I don't have to reiterate too much. Um, it is what it is. And I said I was going to pick off everybody in this division, and uh, he's holding my belt. This belt is amazing. It's great. But uh didn't unified and Dana White said it strictly from his mouth and uh, there's nowhere to run man you're in check <laughs> you like to keep busy so you want to do this sooner rather than later or you want to decompress and tackle this in 2018 well you know what's funny is I'm drinking a protein shake right now instead of stuffing my face full of uh, you know like ice cream and smoothies and all that kind of different things I'm enjoying the process my body is great I'm not hurt I didn't take any damage that fight I mean really training in Big Bear and being mentally tough it really forced my body to be able to have, like, a tough shell. Um, you know, I mean, late nights running and then, you know, late nights having people, like, kick my legs, kick my body, and just do these kind of things allowed me to be able to zone in, man. Like, in, in ultimate reality, it was like a, it was, I was in the zone. As soon as, 
as soon as he picked me up, I was like, this isn't wrestling. Don't worry about it. I was like, he's going to get tired. He's going to get tired. And all these guys, they just don't, they don't have the same kind of game plan I do. And they don't have the same kind of prep. Um, and I'm going to take that with me no matter what. And uh, whoever's next is going to have their hands full for sure. Tony, in this fight, we heard you had an easier weight cut. I think you were just three pounds over the night before. Now, going back to the Habib Nur Nurmagomedov fight, he had the issues. He couldn't fight. However, I thought you had stated, and I don't know if it was jokingly or serious, that even you kind of had a little bit of a wobble, a little bit lightheaded. What was different about that weight cut than this one? No, there was no lightheadedness. There was nothing about that. This is all mental games uh, to try to get Kevin Lee to just keep coming forward with it. The, the the process that I have for the weight cut was amazing. Uh, my sponsor is cutting weight. You know, they gave me a suit, a sauna suit, which absolutely helps. It kept me warm at Big Bear, uh, so I didn't have to worry about like layering up and not being able to breathe. And then my uh, my nutritionist went during fight week. They were he, she was on point. Michelle from Perfecting Athletes was on point um, and allowed me to be able to eat even the night before my weigh in. So I was eating apple slices and some uh, caramel apples. So the plan was just to make sure to stay cool, calm, and collected and to enjoy the process because the process, you have to be able to be coached. Uh, one thing that Dana White said in his post-fight was that with Kevin Lee, he had all of, the, all of the tools that he needed to be able to have a great weight cut. But you got to be able to be coachable and you have to be able to listen. Um, I have a great team around me. I li really listened. I pushed myself. I knew when to say no and I knew when to say yes. Uh, and that takes a lot of experience in um uh, really, the cut was the cut was not a big, huge deal. I mean, in the morning, it was a little bit kind of groggy because I had to wake up earlier and lose two pounds. But instead of actually like going and um, instead of actually going and um, sorry about that, instead of going and actually running it off, I actually sweated off inside the tub. I was taking an Epsom salt bath, and it was amazing. <laughs> Tony Ferguson, our guest here on MMA Junkie Radio. He's the new UFC interim lightweight champion, and all talk is of a unification bout versus Conor McGregor. We're definitely excited about that. Let me send it over to the boys in the studio over at the Mandalay Bay. Goes and Dan, what do you have for the champ? Tony, we've been talking to you for a very long time, and your mission statement has not changed throughout the years. You've basically told us this is what you're going to do, I think, since the first time we interviewed you. But along the way, sometimes the script changes a little bit and life happens. Was there ever a moment in your life where you felt like maybe it wouldn't happen? Uh, yeah. I mean, you guys have seen me. You guys have seen me grow. Um, you know, and I thought that boxing was the only thing I could do besides wrestling. I ended up getting my arm broke. Uh, unfortunately, that put me off for a long time. Uh, financially and mentally and physically and emotionally, it took a big hit. It sucked, man, being on the sidelines. And uh, if you know me, I'm always game and I like to play. I hate being benched, man. And that's exactly what it felt like. I thought I was going to have to go take another job. Um, I had really good support. I had a really great team around me that really helped encourage me. And to get me to that next level, I had to find a great circle to be able to get me to that next level. You know, I found management. I found a good team to help push me to that next level. I really try to stay humble and stay focused and, you know, just keep faith, family, and friends with me, man. And there's no sad story here. It is what it is, and it's just what any man would do to, you know, help his family out and uh succeed i'm not a quitter and i've never been a quitter and i won't stop and I, and I can't stop even with a broken arm so i wasn't gonna stop me anytime soon and i'm glad it made me who i am today who got the biggest i told you so over the weekend oh what do you mean between me and kevin no like uh, amongst you know, know uh people in your circle friends family was there anyone that you just kind of told them i told you i'd do it like did anyone ever uh, doubt you i guess no, not anybody in my circle. No, absolutely not. Um, we had a suite, which we did a practice right before the workout. Uh, the night before, I really, I, I'm, a, I'm my own kind of coach, too. I have to be my mixed martial arts coach. I have, it's like Ocean's Eleven with my team. We, we all specialize in different types of things, but I have to be the one that really pulls it all together. Uh, it's like an artist that has different kinds of colors. You have to be able to paint that picture for everybody. And I really went to the drawing board the night before when everybody went to sleep. Uh, it was a late night. I was writing down all my notes, what I really needed to clear out, you know, as far as like my stand up or how many minutes this is going to take or uh, what is going to take for me to be able to defend that shot or, or get comfortable in that kind of position. Or if my jujitsu wasn't up to par, like in a certain things or my feet weren't hitting right or I wasn't hip escaping right, I had to make sure I was drilling it over and over and over again. So that way it was textbook. You know, it's funny. I call it textbook Tony, but 
in the sense it has to be that way. And uh, the biggest I told you so was to myself that I knew I could do it. Um, never, not one time did any of my camp ever doubt me. Um, I, like I said, I allow myself to be coachable this fight, which is a crazy one because I like to be a control freak and I like to be able to control all the variables. But I'm the constant and the variables were my team, and uh, we came out with victory, man. You know, if you ever want to expand to Ocean's 13, George and I, we are experts in putting weight back on people. So if you ever need that role <laughs> filled, we can help you out there. Absolutely. I won't go back up to 200 pounds, though. <laughs> Screw that. That's, that's not healthy. I did I did the cut. I put on a lot of muscle weight. I mean, I, obviously, I could have put on a lot more. But I think it was just like a big mental toughness thing that I really needed to accomplish for myself. So that way I could get over Khabib in that aspect. To be like, you know what, it is possible. Maybe he's just not mentally ready for me. You know, that's what it was in the case. I'm sure he's been kicking himself, but, you know, I'm glad that Kevin Lee was the, the game opponent that he was. He talked a lot of shit, man. He talked a lot of mad shit. It was hard to be able to push forward with it. And with all the things that happened in fight week, it was just it was just a crazy experience. Um, my team really helped me stay focused. My family, my wife, they just kind of be like, you know, just relax. And my coach was like, smile, Tony. And that was the team for the camp, and that was the team for the fight. You know, Tony, you spoke about textbook finishes. Uh, you know, your finish of a triangle wasn't exactly textbook, and I, don't, I, and I don't mean that in a bad way at all. In fact, we were doing a live stream here and kind of doing a commentary on the fight, and one of the things I said was, as soon as you locked it up, I said he doesn't gonna, he's not going to need to put that arm across. When you have a muscly arm guy with those head and arm-based chokes, it's less room for error. Now, did, did you already know it was done by then and that's why you didn't bother to put the arm across you just crunched in or did you know you were getting the triangle when you threw up the arm bar before the triangle even happened well i combo up not just only in my punches it's textbook to me because it is textbook if you think about it there's certain levels to it if i'm going to pull the arm across that's the last and the final one but if i pull the arm across on the other side i have a kimura there too i also have a couple other kinds of finishes there where i can help establish it settle the bull down and, and make sure that it's controlled. As soon as I would have pulled the arm across, I, I was thinking in my head, I'm risking for him to be able to slip out because he slipped out already one time. And it was kind of like in a dangerous situation, but I felt like in no danger, especially when he had mount. I mean, really, and honestly, you can talk to Coach Eddie Bravo, he'll tell you the same thing, that I was more than prepared for any of the stuff that he had going towards me. And not one time was I ever in danger. I always, I mean, anytime that he was in my guard or any of my practice partners, I told him, Throw punches at me so I can emulate the fact that I can see them coming at me and I can slip them. If he's going to throw elbows, I know my forearms are way in shape. And the triangle was there because I knew he was going to be overly aggressive. His energy level was going to be to kaput. I mean, against the cage, I had a can opener and I put my, my feet on his hips. And as soon as I kicked him off, I just saw despair. It was like kind of like the same thing I've seen all of my opponents do when they shoot in on me, especially kind of like Edson Barbosa. It's that panic look. And he had to panic. I knew that when he was going to take me down, I was going to have to unleash everything that I had with elbows, punches, and be able to make him want to posture down and set up for that triangle. I mean, really, I have probably like five finishes from that triangle setup, so it's textbook to me. Awesome, awesome. Tony, we'll close, we'll close with this. I'm just going to be the guy at the Laker game that gets chosen at halftime to do the half-court shot. Most of the time it misses, sometimes it hits. When are you and Connor going to mix it up? You think it's going to be something like next year during St. Paddy's Day? Could it happen at the end of the year here in Las Vegas, UFC 219? What's your gut tell you when something like this could go down? Well, for myself, I'm going to take a couple of days here. I'm going to take my phone on a nice vacation. Um, and uh, I'm going to stay healthy. I'm in great shape, and I know that he's been kind of enjoying his rise. And, you know, as you heard Dana, he's de-stressing and deflating. He'll do whatever he's got to fucking do. I don't care. But what he needs to do is defend or vacate. That dude's got like less than a month. I mean, compared to what UFC rule states, he's got a year to start defending his belt. I'm more than ready for December. He said he wants to fight in 2017. I think the fans deserve it. I think I deserve it. And what sounds better than 10 consecutive? 11. And uh, it's got Connor's name written all over that motherfucker. And uh, you guys heard my post speech. And uh, there's nowhere for him to run, man. He's got me to deal with. And uh, I'm going to expose that dude. The good thing is, you guys, I think, I think it's a good thing. You guys share the same manager, so it, it shouldn't be, it's not like you have to go through another party. It, it's just one phone call, and that same guy, you know, I guess, uh, Audi in this case, being able to put this together. Well, we would hope so, man, because, you know, you heard Dana say that the Diaz and Connor thing is full of shit. You know, it's just internet hoopla. But the real fight is, the, it's not about the money fight, it's about the pride fight. 
and this dude's going to be sitting on the sidelines if he doesn't want to fight. And I don't think he wants that grubby little belt to be in my hands because uh, I'll enjoy it and I will defend it. That dude hasn't defended that belt one time. Not one time. I will probably defend my interim belt more times than that dude would ever defend that belt. So he needs to put it in somebody's hands that needs to go. I already told him one time, he was like, just set it down and walk away and nobody will get hurt. But in ultimate reality, we want the fans to have the fight. And uh, I think the fans need to deserve it straight up because uh, he's the next one in line, man, and Khabib's not there. So uh, he's, out of the, he's out of line, man. He's not even in the picture. So, Connor, I, you need to fucking defend or vacate and you get your shit together and come here and fight me, dude, straight up. There you go. The chess master putting McGregor in check. Hopefully it does go down at the end of the year in Vegas. Tony says he's ready. And if Connor says he wants to lock it in, then we might have a, a matchup here, folks. In the meantime, Tony, go enjoy the family. Go enjoy the fruits of your labor. Take some time Tony. off. That was a great buildup, you and Kevin, and a great fight on Saturday night at UFC 216. Congratulations, champ. All right, thank you, guys. Appreciate you. Okay. All right, take care. All right, we'll see you. Big shout out to Zach Pavkov for helping line that one up. Tony Ferguson, the new lightweight champion. Uh, yes, it's in the in the interim, but uh, I think this bad boy is going to get decided pretty soon. Him versus Conor McGregor has some legs now. You can follow Tony on Twitter at Tony Ferguson XT. Bobby Let him know you heard him on the at MMA Junkie Radio Show. And now from one standout lightweight to the next, we go to Bobby Green, who on Twitter is Bobby K Green. He now joins us on MMA Junkie Radio. What's up, Bobby? How you doing? That's what's up. I'm good. I'm good. All right, man. Welcome back to MMA Junkie Radio. You're on with George, Goes, and Dan. Happy to have you. Happy to see you back in action where you belong in that octagon doing your thing. What an entertaining fight, and I'm glad you're taking home 50 Gs, brother. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was awesome, bro. It's a freaking blessing. Yeah. So let me ask you this, though. You know, we, we were kind of going over the salaries on the early part of the show, and, of course, uh, you know, Nevada's public about that. We know what you took home. We know what Lando took home. And then, of course, you guys get 50 Gs each. But what about that win bonus? Like, neither one of you technically lost. Should the UFC do something in regards to maybe taking the the bigger bonus of the two, splitting it in half? Or have you been told there'll be a discretionary? I mean, that was one hell of a fight. And, again, neither guy man. lost. I know neither guy won, but I'm trying to put more pocket in your guys' pockets. Or more bread hey, in your guys' pockets. I hear you, on that. That would be lovely. That would be lovely, you know, if we could have a little tweak to the rules, you know, and, and make some better opportunities to make more money. You know, I felt the same way. I bet Lando felt the same way. You know, it's just like, you wish you had that win bonus. It's like so hard for that win bonus. Everybody's counting on the win, you know, and when you have to come home off of, uh, don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm, I'm a blessed and I'm thankful for every opportunity and everything I get, sorry. Bobby, we're losing you. You there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, there you go. All right. Hey, Jimmy. Um, hey, by the way, you know, a, a bunch of ideas have been tossed out, but would you have been down with a, a sudden victory extra round if somehow this was possible through the, the through the commission and the you UFC? know, um, yes, yes. That sounds like a good idea, you know, like just to maybe we could finish it up. I think like at that point in time we were there, uh, I was really catching on to what he was doing more and my uh, punches being more effective. So I think that would be awesome if we could have another round of it, you know, but at the same time, is that can constitute like uh, more pay or what, you know, like is that, because at the same time, don't get me wrong, you do want to, you do want to uh, find a winner. You know, and the crowd wants to see more action. But to be honest, they want to see action at the at the uh, expense of two two good guys, two great fighters. You know, and mm -hmm. should we get paid more for that? That's a good question. I should be asking you, right? Yeah, you know, I uh, I, I don't think at that moment that that's something that they would do. But I guess the risk exactly, or not, but you, but the you risk want reward. Us to fight more. You want you want us to yeah. play ourselves more in there and knock each other out more, which is cool. I mean, I'm all down for it, but. Yeah, you asked me to fight more, but you asked him to pay me more, you know? <laughs> like, right. I'm all down for the fight, bro. Don't get me wrong, but there's two human beings, you know, losing their fucking lives. Like, I take shots, and he took shots, you know? And that's just the way it is. And I'm going to do that every time I get in the cage, and you, and I can, you can bet on that, you know? So, it's always one of those crazy fights with me. So, that, you want me to now give you more of it? And for, what, the same dollar amount? You know, okay. Well, no, no. I mean, yeah. I, I guess I'm, what I'm arriving at is if the UFC were to not change their policy of of the uh, oh, win yeah, bonus, yeah, then yeah. at least this, this makes one the of the best and ultimate. Yeah, I'm following you. Yeah, yeah. 
Bobby Green here, uh, our guest on MMA Junkie Radio. Fought to a draw, a split draw with Lando Venata at UFC 216. However, they both did take fight of the night. It was an outstanding fight. All right, let me send it over to the boys at the Mandalay Bay. Goes and Dan Tom, what do you have for Bobby Green? Bobby, at the end of the fight, you and Lando embrace, and you both had these big smiles on your face. A battle like that that you went through, does that create kind of a certain bond that you guys will just carry the rest of your lives? Um, did you guys get a chance to talk after the fight? What you talk about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I heard he went to the hospital. So um, I went back and I did my thing. I went to the, the couple bars and stuff and let everybody know that he came out and supported me, come out and hang out with me. And I, I just really just sat down with my family and friends and thanked everybody, talked about the fight, talked about my experiences and how thankful I am for them and, and that they were all a part of that. After that, shit, like I bumped into... Lando up at uh, a bar like later on at night. He was at a bar. And I'm like, hey, what's up? I gave him, gave him a big hug. Just let him know we're brothers of war, you know. That was fucking awesome. And I'm down to do it again if he wants to do it again. But at the same time, we should get paid more for doing what we're going to do, you know. Um, but at the same time, that was it. Just let him know it was dope. Like Those are great experiences, and I will always remember that, t that type of shit, you know. Mm -hmm. like, especially when you get guys in there. Like, I expected my bulls to give me that type of fight, you know. One of those fight at night fights that you'll never forget, you know, where two guys go in there and put their lives on the line. But uh, Lando was a guy. Uh, if they were to give you that option of doing the fight again, would you take it over a fresh matchup? I mean, keep it real with you, and that's all I can do is keep it real. Like, the tough guy in me wants to say, yeah, yeah, I'll take it, you know? Like, dope. Uh, I think it would be another one of those. But, I mean, just to be honest with you, it's like, I'm not going to be paid anymore to do that or do that, so I might as well go on into another fight, right? Wouldn't that make common sense? Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of another fight, Bobby, you know, touching on something you said earlier, you guys you guys gave it all, and people that don't know Bobby Green gives it at all, I think you reminded people with your performance. I'm, you certainly made more fans this weekend, but again, there was a yes, lot of damage taken. I so definitely, i got to say, i got to be a man into that. I slept on a lot of my... Uh, a lot of my fans, you know, like, uh, slept on a lot of my on my last two fights. Like, it, I really wasn't impressed with them. I felt like I was missing some things. Um, I, I lost myself, you know, more so than anything, you know. I deal with a lot in my own life and personal stuff. So, sometimes that always it, it comes out into my art, you know. This is not, uh, for me, this is art. Okay, like, my, I call my style poetry in motion. It's just freaking art. I'm throwing something out there. It's a painting. Like, people ask me now about decisions and how I feel about the decisions. I really don't care about the decision because I'm just doing art and you just tell me your opinion, that's cool. But at the end of the day, like there's sometimes where I feel I want to fight and then give it to the other guy. And so I can't, that's the guy's, that's another guy's opinion, you know? That's another guy's uh, portrait of my art, you know? He, he's telling me his critique of it, you know? And that's cool. I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that, you know? But at the end of the day, it's not about win or lose. It's about putting on a performance and, and put, making an art piece. Well, I guess my question would be, when would you want to make your next art piece? Is it something you want to get right back in there and do after after a crazy fight like this? Or what's Bobby Green feeling right now? Um, you know, I, I'm, I've been noticing that I'm kind of like the sneak attack guy, you know? Like, to be honest, I was a fill-in. I was actually somebody else's fight that was supposed to be doing this, you know? So I hopped in and did that. Um, I think that it's... Uh, I like the whole just jumping in, you know. I like to just catch another guy on short notice. Everybody call me in and say, hey, you got to fight in four, eight, four to eight weeks, you know. Jump in. You want to jump in? Cool. You know what I mean? Just depending upon, like, where it is. Like, to be honest, I didn't have to fly. I don't like to fly. I'm afraid of heights. I'm afraid of needles. And I have to face my fears every fucking time I do this job. And I'm like, ah, I don't know if I want to do this. But I have to go fly all the way over to Kansas City and get called crazy names and stuff because people don't understand my style so i don't know it's, uh, i like to just jump into things do my thing like i'm not about this whole i'm only doing this interview i'm not doing a bunch of interviews after this i just like to freaking do like my own thing you know and like before this problem is that i've been letting people get in my head i've been watching your comments and watching people kick me like and say i'm this and that so i just really have to focus on me more so and and get away from social media stuff and just focus on doing fighting, you know, and giving people good shows. That's all I can do. Bobby, I did want to ask you, you know, I don't know if you heard, but Dana White really was congratulatory, not just towards the fight, but your bravado, you know, with that, the, the knee that you took. 
uh, he stated, and I, again, I don't know if you heard it or not, that you, I mean, you shook it off and you were ready, ready to go. So you gained, uh, you know, a, a lot of respect uh, with him. And so, first of all, did you catch? Did you catch his, yeah. So, so he, I'm glad I can pass that on to you. That that's what he said. Uh, so he, he spoke very highly of you and the fight. But I'm thinking, uh, you know, you're speaking with a lot of passion. You've definitely paid your dues in the sport. Uh, you took this fight on late notice. Regardless of where you are with, with your contract situation, uh, I'm a supporter of the fact that you're right. If you're going to get back in there, I think you've earned it already for you to be getting more pay. Have you ever thought about just pulling them aside and saying, Dana, let, let, let's talk about some more um, money? I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm, no, a, I'm no, a pretty no, solid. No, 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 no. That sounds great, you know, but then I'll look like, like, uh, like I'm demanding these certain things, and I'm not really trying to demand anything, you know. Like, it, it'll come when it comes. If they if they feel like I'm uh, doing good art, they're going to bless me, and I just that's what they're going to do. I don't really like to pull on people's shells and, hey, no, no, it's okay. Like, if you're going to see this art, I really think we're all underpaid as MMA fighters, but I keep, like, there's some other fighters that have it worse than me, so I can't complain, you know. I'm just I just did this sport just because I had a kid, you know. And I'm all the way here, you know. I've been ranked one of the top in the world. And it's like, I've already done it, you know. So it's just like, I me, mean, it's just fun, you know. And I just got to focus on having fun again. I let everybody in the whole, taking it too serious. This shit is like whatever to me, you know. Like, be honest with you, I work side jobs and do other things too. Like, it's just like whatever. I have fun with this now. I'm really going to just focus on when I want to focus. I do it. And I get out of here and I'll go now and go work on cars. Or now I'm going to go work on gas and electrical in the home. You know, like I got to do other stuff, you know. So when I when, when I want to sit back down and do MMA fighting and they want me to come back in, I'll come back in and do what I got to do. Besides that, it's all the same stuff, bro. It's all the same stuff. Yes, baby? Right. Hold on, Daddy's talking. I'll be with him in a second. How, how, uh, guys. It, it's all right. How, um, is that, uh, how many kids do you have, Bobby? I have three. I have one a uh, black child, a white child, and a Mexican child. <laughs> There you go. All right. And are any of them old enough? Were any of them old enough to catch your fight on Saturday? Uh, my son's eight. My daughter's three. She watched it. Um, and my son's one. He was supposedly cheering me on, too. So I'm good with every woman in my life. You know, stuff happens. You know, but I definitely love to be a, a great dad. I try to spend as much time as I can between jobs and between trying to provide for them to actually be there and spend time with them. You know, but when you have three different places you have to be. Hard. Right. Well, what I was getting at was, what did your family and friends think of the fight? That, that, that was a classic on Saturday night. Um, they all think I won, <laughs> and why I'm not complaining, and now I'm not saying this. That's what they all say. But you know, when you definitely have a uh, size, I bet Lando's family told him he won. You know, when you have size and stuff like that, it's just what it is. You know, I just fucking like, hey. I did it, and it's cool. If you like it, you like it, it's dope. You know what I'm saying? Like, and everybody's like, oh, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, man, I just did it, and it's just fun, you know? I just did it. Whatever the art is, whatever the art is. Yeah. If you ask your opinion, cool, thank you. So now you feel the other way? I don't, I'm not mad. Like, you can be honest. You know, whatever it is is whatever it is. My man, I appreciate the time as always. We appreciate the time as always here on MMA Junkie Radio. Uh, seriously an outstanding fight to watch not only as a media guy but as fan as a fan so uh thank you for Appreciate that hopefully that, we get to see you uh again soon and don't forget we're not that far away in vegas if you're ever in vegas we'd love to have you co-host i love episode. the vegas shows like if there's another vegas show and somebody pops up maybe i'll pop in on one of those you know it's dope like i, I really don't care like i just don't like to fly i'm like uh if i can dry there you're dry there sounds good my man all right thanks for the time all right bro Peace. all right we'll see you all right, folks, that is Bobby Green, UFC lightweight, fought at UFC 216, got a bonus, split draw there with Lando Venata. If they run it back, I'm in, and if it's a fresh matchup, uh, I'm in. I've always enjoyed watching Bobby Green fight all the way back from the King of the Cage days, of course, Affliction, Strike Force, and now in the UFC. We're going to take a break here. When we come back, we'll be talking to Chicano John, John Moraga, a winner at UFC 216, so stay close.
to link into the MMA Junkie Radio Network. Hit us up on Twitter.com at MMA Junkie Radio. This is MMA Junkie Radio. Here are your hosts, Gorgeous George and Goes. Whether you lost your foot, uh, fantasy football game and need to vent about it or brag after a big win, the place to do it is SiriusXM Fantasy Sports Radio. Reaction to Week 5 in fantasy football can be heard on Sirius 210, XM87, and on the SiriusXM app. All right, folks, we're going to continue on here with our lineup of guests. Simon Samano starting things off, followed by Tony Ferguson, Bobby Green, and now we now have another superstar from the UFC 216 card coming off a huge win over Magomed Bibulatov. His name is John Moraga. Vicious, vicious KO there uh, on Saturday night. He joins us now on MMA Junkie Radio. What's up, John? How you doing? Hey, what's up, guys? Not much, man. <laughs> Fuck. You lit that cat up. Congratulations on your win this past Saturday. So that that was really, really uh, uh, a beautiful, striking finish, man. I, uh, I, I have a fond appreciation for stuff like that. You, you really, really nailed them. Thank you. Thank you for that. Mm-hmm. Um, now, obviously, afterwards, you were very emotional. I know the win meant a lot to you. You were talking about your kids and how much you want to see them. So you really didn't kind of have that release that a lot of other fighters have where they're jumping on the cage, dumping their chest, and, you know, going berserk in that way. Um, even though you didn't show it, were you feeling that? Um, I believe, you know, like right right after it happened, I mean, I went, I went through that for a quick second, you know, when the ref pulls you off of me or pulled me off of him or stepped in or whatever but uh i don't know it just hit me real quick you know it was like a big overwhelming feeling whatever it was Mm -hmm. now obviously you 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 were clear uh, about this in the post fight press conference and even when a few of the journalists tried to ask you hey what were these personal problems that's not what i'm asking but what i am asking is whether it was the money from you know fighting win bonus and performance bonus or whether it was the win did that help uh, solve or cure any of the problems that you have been having at home, at least? Um, I mean, no, no, there's a lot of stuff going on, but uh, no, not really. I mean, it's, it's always good to have a win. You know, I think uh, the biggest thing, just been years of hard work, man, years of grinding, years of, right. uh, I've been at this for a while, man, it just hasn't seem like it's been paying off you know it it has been but at the same time it really hasn't so it's, it hasn't been what i've uh needed it to be so it was just a big win for my career for for everything you know so it was just uh just got overwhelmed i remember a few years ago when we had you on the show actually made it may have been earlier this year um but you know close to about a year you had even contemplated maybe retiring and just moving on if this wasn't going to pay off for you do you still feel the same way, or has 2017 uh, changed its course, you know, as far as your career is concerned? Uh, leaving out the January 15th loss to Pettis, of course, but I'm talking about the last two wins here in 2017. Well, first of all, I never contemplated it. You know, I never in my head thought about that. It's just uh-huh. that they happened to ask me in the interview, and, you know, I just, off the top of my head, I said, well... If I was to get cut, you know, I don't really, I don't really know why I would want to put myself through this a, a, a lot more. But uh, I don't think it was ever really in my head. You know, I never really thought about quitting or letting that happen. So uh, no, I mean, I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm in, uh, I'm probably in my prime right now. You know, I've got a lot of experience. I've got, I know how to train. I know my body better. Um, you're talking about somebody that I, man, I can't shut off the streets, man. I don't. I'm I'm barely learning how to be a professional athlete, so um, it's all falling together for me. The mean streets of West Phoenix, right? Yeah. All right. You you, uh, you know this is different form of combat, but do you gain that? You continue to gain street cred from you know your your friends, you know, back from those days. Is there contact with them uh, at all? Uh, you know, because this was an awesome KO, man, for anyone to appreciate. Uh, I, t- I talk to all my people, all my close people still, you know, so, I mean, I don't really, I don't know if we call, I don't know what street kid you're talking about, we're, we're older, we, and we're not in the streets like that, so, um, I mean, 
Yeah. Okay. Um, now, another thing I wanted to ask you, when flyweights are interviewed, usually a lot of them just, how can I say it, they don't seem to give much in terms of what could be next on their road to the title. How frustrating is it to be in the same division as someone as great as Demetrius Johnson? I mean, it seems like for a lot of you that have fought him, you know, obviously him losing would be of great benefit because it opens things up. Otherwise, everyone's fighting for a rematch, and then you got some of the young cats that are that are gun informed that haven't fought. But um, what's it like being in the same division as one of the all-time greats? Is it frustrating or motivating in that you know maybe you might be the guy to pull it off if you can get back to that spot? Well, yeah, first of all, Demetrius was a vet, you know, when this weight class was first opened up. He was already a veteran. He already had all the experience in the world against some of the best in the world. And and he had a step ahead of us, you know, and he's been able to get the belt and and uh, stay ahead. It's, first of all, he's uh, an impressive fighter. He's just, you know, one of the best. And then on top of that, you know, he's also been fighting a lot of guys that, aren't, you know, they like when they put me against them, you know, I had I had no idea that the experience, that the inexperience that I had would, would um, you know, be such a factor. And uh, and he just, he's been able to keep fighting people like that. They keep throwing people that are not ready to fight him. So I think that's helped him out a little bit too, you know. But, uh, you know, I've got a lot more experience under my belt now. I'm sure there's a couple other people also. So, um uh, you know, hopefully in the near future, you know, I can work my way back there or, you know, but he's he's doing a hell of a job. You can't really hate on him. Mm-hmm. How far do you feel like you are away from uh, Demetrius Johnson rematch talk? Uh, and, and do you want to get there quick or do you still feel like there's strides to get better before you take on a monumental task like that? Well, the only the only bad thing is uh, from a business standpoint, you know what I mean? <laughs> I didn't have a great experience. I fought the guy for seventeen thousand dollars, so it, it was, uh, you know, after that, and you lose, you're kind of it's uh, it's a rough road back. So me right now, I'm just gonna be content with uh, getting some more wins and uh, stacking my stacking my money a little bit. And uh, if the opportunity should come up quick, you know, I, I'm never not one to turn anything down. I mean, I fought Pettis on the two weeks notice and because it was in my home town and I wasn't even really training, able to train for that fight. So I, I have a hard time and I don't make the best business decisions, but, uh, that's going to try to be my focus from here on out. Let's try, try to, to get things going in the right direction. Do you have new management now? I think in the past you worked with Malky and I don't, I, if I recall, it didn't go well, but do you have new management or do you manage yourself? Um, I work with Malky's brother, uh, Abe. I mean, oh, okay. it's still first first round management, but uh, yeah. All right. And lastly, before I send it to the boys over at the Mandalay Bay, um, where are you in regards to uh, a new contract? I mean, some of these salaries that came out were pretty impressive. For for example, Ferguson and Lee, and I think you know you've kind of been putting in that kind of time, like like they have. Now I know lighter weight classes may not, you know, get some of those bigger dollars like like some of the other guys are, but where are you? Do you feel like you're close to, or are you close to maybe getting a new contract, and can you maybe uh, cash in? Um, I'm, I'm nowhere close. I, well, I mean, I just signed a new contract, but uh, I was in no position to really negotiate uh, for myself a whole lot, so I had to kind of get what they take me, or take what they give me, but, uh, you know, it God's good. I'm just thankful for all my blessings. So I'm just ready to uh, ready to make the most of it. And uh, however hard they want to make me earn it, um, just I'm gonna earn it. What'd your kids say to you when you saw them, in terms of uh, their thoughts on the fight? <laughs> um, they don't really understand it. You know, my son was. I told my son. I really. He's been asking me for a long time if he could go to Vegas to watch me fight, and um, he's only been—he's been to two of my fights, the two in Phoenix. And um, I don't know, man. It's—it's it's hard, you know, decision to make to let 
your son watch you fight. I've been through some fights where, uh, you, I don't know, man, we can get really hurt, you know, so you go into the thing confident, but, you know, you never really know what, what's going to happen. There's, it can go bad. I knew I was fighting a really fucking tough guy, so, uh, I didn't, I didn't really want him to go, but it, it was just, he's been asking me for a while, and when he knew I was fighting, he asked to go, and I made the decision to let him go, so uh, I wanted to just prepare him, you know, I told him it was going to be a war of a fight, that I was probably going to come out, you know, win, lose, or draw, I was going to be pretty beat up, and pretty bad, and I didn't know how much we were going to be able to hang out that night, and whatnot. And so he, when I was done, he was like, I thought you said it was going to be tough. <laughs> <laughs> that is pretty funny. What happened? I thought you said it was going to be a hard night's work. That was easy, Pops. <laughs> John Moraga, our guest here on MMA Junkie Radio. All right, goes and Dan, what do you have for John? Uh, John, just to piggyback off of what George was talking about, you, you fought the champ in 2013. And you brought up experience. Do you feel like that would be the one thing that you would be bringing to the table this time that would be different? Or are there other tricks up your sleeve? Well, I've definitely improved my skills. Um, you know, I feel like I have. You know, I I, I also feel, you know, like so every fight is different also, man. If you take, I, I've been injured a lot. And so every time you take off that month, two months, three months, whatever it is, I mean, two, you can take off a week or two weeks, and you're still not going to come back as sharp as you were two weeks ago. And the longer and longer that you, that um you know you take and i've had those injuries where i've had to be out for months at a time and so when you come back uh you know i was hoping in the past that the experience and me just putting in the hours in the gym sparring all that stuff um you know that like i've been through this before it's going to come out in the fight and whatnot but that doesn't happen man you gotta actually be well prepared your timing your all kinds of little stuff that just Maybe you were working on it before, and it's just not as sharp when you come back, or you're... There's so much to mixed martial arts, so um, it's a lot to put together and, and just be in your rhythm and have things going, and I feel like that's kind of really... Um, I could tell what it was in each different fight, all the different stuff, so right now I feel like it's a really good time that I've been able to stay in the gym, I've been able to improve my skills over the years, and now... Um, you know, as long as I can keep this consistency, be injury free. I mean, I think I'm I'm a very very dangerous fighter to anybody in the division. You know, whoever it is. Now, John, you said you didn't uh, feel that you had enough uh, maybe uh, room to speak for your contract negotiations last time around. But what about matchup negotiations? You seem like a guy who will take on anybody in any any time, and the matchmakers must like you because you know or respect you because you're always going against top uh, top talent in the division. But if John Moraga could choose, is there a, a time of the year, a venue, a state, or maybe even an opponent that you would like next? Um, if I could choose. Uh yeah, I want the easiest opponents right now. <laughs> I want to stack my money and fight the easiest opponents and, you know, get some highlights, raise my stock a little bit, and then be able to fight the top guys for more money and make it worth it because I fought them all for the for pennies, you know what I mean, basically. And, and it, you know, I just made bad business decisions. and I still felt I could have won a lot of those fights. But, uh, you know, I have the experience now. I have... Uh, improved skills i have a great team so i mean i think sky's the limit who are those easy flyweights john care to name them or are you going to hang on to that one you know what there's not very many man there's not very many and in fact i wanted to move up to 135 after my last fight because uh you know i just wanted to try it and for the fact that i feel like Maybe at 135, man, there's a lot more contenders that aren't. I mean, I feel like we got a lot of the toughest guys. Uh, I know they signed a lot more people, so I, I, I haven't been paying attention too much um, and watching everybody's fights lately like I used to in the flyweight division. But uh, but I know there's a lot of tough people out there, man, and, and most most of these guys are, are very tough fights. I felt like maybe there was probably a couple easier fights to sneak in at 135 and, and you know I haven't really looked so don't quote me on that I can't give you any names either but I wanted to try it and see kind of how I 
how I felt at that weight, put on a little bit of muscle, and, and um, you know, I wrestled 133 in college, and I felt fine, and I've got a little bit more muscle mass. And, um, I think I can put the weight on and do do all right. But uh, but they had me go, they gave me this one, and uh, that's what it was. Yeah, and looking at your resume, man, fuck, you fought a lot of tough guys. You're right, so... Um, I don't know. Maybe maybe you can catch a break. Who knows? Uh, it, it, it boils down to the fact that uh, bantamweight and flyweight. I mean, if you're in the UFC, you're pretty damn tough. So, in the meantime, look, Saturday night was as great of a script as you could have written. Yeah, it, it doesn't appear that you got hurt. Um, you got in there. You beat a highly decorated fighter. You know, who was a, he was a favorite in Vegas. We we talk odds in Vegas. He was a favorite. I don't know if you're aware of that. So you cash big for anybody that that bet on you. Um, you know, you gave him his first loss, and now now you got a couple uh, a two fight win streak. You got a bonus, so uh, I hope things are well for you and better for you now. And and can't wait to see your next matchup, man. Again, congratulations on that highlight reel, KO. Thank you, thank you very much. Thanks for joining us here on the show, John. We'll talk to you soon. All right, thanks guys. Thanks for having right. me. Thanks, right, John. We'll see you on Twitter at Chicano John. Beautiful KO over Magomed Bibulatov. Uh, Bibulatov will learn from this one. Uh, that was a tough one, man. Every once in a while, you, you just get caught. Uh, but but John, who in the past, you know, we've noted that sometimes his significant strike output s- slows down. And this fight, he went after him, man. So that was very, very impressive. Great adjustment that he made. All right, folks, we're going to take a break. You're listening to MMA Junkie Radio on Sirius XM, Rush 93. We'll close up shop when we come back. They can drink Mentos flavored Diet Coke without their stomachs giving a single fuck. They are gorgeous George and Goes. And this is MMA Junkie Radio. Alright folks, we're going to wrap up on time here. Uh, We had some guests. We want to start turning over all of our post-show work. So we will talk a little bit more about Dantas and Caldwell tomorrow. And of course we'll continue talking about UFC 216 and a lot of the other stories that came out of here. 
Uh, we'll finish up with Jim from Long Beach. Jim, you got about 45 seconds. What's on your mind, my man? All right. Well, I told you guys Tony Ferguson was going to choke him out in the third round. You guys didn't agree with me. Yeah, it's all rigged. <laughs> hey, did you read my breakdown on MMA Junkie? I, I, I might have agreed with you. <laughs> yeah, well, I said I'm, I was tired of that big mouth. <laughs> Kevin Lee. I never heard of the guy until this summer, so, you know, that's it for him. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, he uh, he won the first round. He had some good moments. So he'll be back. I think he's probably going to go up in weight. But, yeah, he took the loss hard, but he took it like a man. So you got to give him that. Uh, call yeah, him tomorrow, man. Call him tomorrow, and okay. we'll, we'll wrap some more. But uh, I, I do vaguely remember you saying something about Ferguson in the third round. So we'll give that one to you. Thanks, bud. Folks, we're out of here. Uh, thanks to Bobby Green. That's Ed Cap lining that one up. Tony Ferguson, Zach Pavkov lining that one up. John Moraga and Simon Samano, yours truly lined that up. That's why I was fantastic. But shout out to Danny Otto, Goes, and Dan Tom. They weren't too shabby themselves. We will see you all tomorrow with another edition of MMA Junkie Radio, 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific. Until go out there. Until then, go out there and be champions.